Uh, it's a sermon that if I could, I would avoid preaching. So that having uh, got you interested in that, I think we'd better have a word of prayer as we prepare our minds and our hearts to receive from the Lord. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we can come to this portion of your word in Acts chapter 15. And we're very conscious, Lord, that uh, we can preach it in such a way in which we could be judge judgmental and very negative. But we don't want to do it uh, like that, Lord. We want to be positive. We want to be encouraging. We want to be a source of strength. Uh, we pray, Father, that for the help of the Holy Spirit to take of your word and apply it to us in the way that you would have us receive it. And we pray again, Lord, for ourselves, that we might not be just simply hearers of your word, but doers of it also. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to be looking at problems within the church. And certainly there's a, a problem within the church there in Antioch, and it's a problem that spills over into uh, the Jerusalem churches, uh, the Jerusalem church and the other churches that are gathered with the apostles, which we'll see uh, a little bit later on, uh, perhaps over the next few uh, Sundays. But uh, by way of introduction, let's just remind ourselves of the context. And the context is the fact that Paul and Barnabas have come back home, back home to their sending church, back home uh, to Antioch, which, where they had been elders, they had been preachers and leaders. And if you remember some chapters uh, uh, ago, uh, that they had been called of God the Holy Spirit and uh, were appointed by the church on this missionary journey uh, to the Gentiles. Antioch had been the first church where uh, the Gentiles had gathered along with Jewish uh, Christians and uh, it, it had become a, a, a multinational church, Gentile and Jewish believers together worshipping God. And after that first missionary journey, as we mentioned, uh, there were numerous uh, Gentile believers uh, that were, uh, had, uh, had, uh, had come to faith in Jesus and churches uh, uh, in that first mission, missionary journey had been established and uh, we can see something of this when we get to Acts chapter 14 and verse 26 to 28. And there they sailed, that's Paul and Barnabas, uh, to Antioch where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. They'd been away for some time. Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. Because the gospel, of course, is for all peoples, isn't it? Not just for the Jew. So they stayed there, we're told, a long time with the disciples. Now, with the great success, I think we can put it in those terms, uh, Gentile believers, have come, Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus. Gentile churches have been established. There was possibly um, a certain jealousy, uh, certainly amongst perhaps some of the Jewish believers, the people of Judea, Jerusalem, when they heard about these other churches and these uh, uh, Gentile churches, where the majority of uh, the believers were Gentiles. Because previously, uh, uh, the, Jew, the churches were a majority, if not 100% Jewish believers. And there may well have been a certain jealousy amongst the churches in Judea and amongst a certain Jewish uh, Christians, so much so that we discover in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, that there comes uh, a group of people who start preaching a different gospel. And as I was thinking about that, it reminded me of a parable that the Lord Jesus said uh, in Matthew 20 and verse 14 to 16. Uh, the parable is about the, uh, the, the laborers who are working in the vineyard. Remember that the, 
uh, the owner of the vineyard comes down the first hour of the morning and he uh, is able to get some workers to work in his vineyard and he comes down at different hours and eventually comes to the very last hour of the day and there are still people who uh, are wanting to work and uh, he employs them and at the end of the day uh, they give them the day's wage, you remember. And uh, the people who, who only work for an hour, they received exactly the same amount of money as the people who started right at the beginning of the day. And there's a bit of animosity about that. And uh, let's read what Jesus says in that uh, parable. Um, the, the people who had uh, labored long, while the owner of the vineyard says, and this is the words of Jesus, take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give them, I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it lawful, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now it could be that the Jewish Christians wanted to think of themselves as perhaps, <laughs> if you can put it like this, premiership Christians, and that these Gentiles were championship Christians. So they were in another division. But for God, whether you're Jew or Gentile, there's no difference. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you're a Christian, and you're bound for heaven. And there may well have been this, this uh, thought in some of the Jewish Christians, we, we have been steeped, up in, steeped in the Old Testament, uh, we know all about Moses and the law, and, and these Gentiles who know nothing about the Old Testament, who, who didn't know anything about Moses, have come into the kingdom as well. And perhaps they were saying to themselves, it doesn't seem fair. Uh, they need to be like we are. They need to be steeped in the Old Testament. Perhaps they, they were saying to themselves, they need to have a Jewish background. They need to become Jews. That's the problem that Acts chapter 15 verse 1 has. And... I want to say this before we move into this section, that jealousies can happen in churches too. You can have a small church that's seeking to be faithful, preaching the gospel, and not too far away is another church which has got full of people, and uh, it seems to be so exciting, people are crowding in. We've got a, um, a charismatic preacher that's drawing a great crowd, and then it's uh, dangerous is to be jealous, isn't it? Why is God blessing that church and not our church? And the danger is to start thinking in terms of there must be, they, must, they can't be preaching the gospel that we know. But God will bless whoever he wants. And we are to be faithful to our own Lord in the vineyard. We have to be faithful in that part of the vineyard that God has placed us in. So we're going to be thinking about problems within the church uh, this evening. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't want to preach about it. But let's uh, move on. I've got uh, several points that I want to say. And the first one of those is this, that true gospel work can expect trouble. If the church, if a preacher is faithful to the gospel, you can expect trouble. And whenever the Church of Christ is truly making inroads into the, 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 uh, the devil's kingdom, we know that there will be a backlash from the devil. We can expect trouble. And that was certainly true uh, from, uh, for the, for, um, uh, that was certainly true of the experience of the church at Antioch, wasn't it? Uh, Paul and Barnabas have come back and they're rejoicing in the fact that these churches have uh, been established, that they've sent uh, Paul and Barnabas out with their prayers and their blessing, and they've come back and they've said, God has done wonderful things, and there's these, these, there's these places where there's the now a church, where they're being faithful to the Lord, and they're rejoicing in that. Well, the devil doesn't like that, does he? He doesn't like rejoicing Christians. He doesn't like the fact that that uh, people are believing in Jesus and churches are being formed. And that was certainly the experience of uh, 
the Antioch church. There in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, we read that a certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. They were people who were coming and claiming to be preachers, claiming to be teachers, perhaps trying to give some kind of extra authority in what they're saying. We've come from Jerusalem, we come from Judea. Um, and they've said this, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And they were saying this, weren't they? Well, you have to, you can, it's all very well being a Christian, it's all very well believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, but don't you realize you need to be a Jew? You need to be Jewish. Men need to be circumcised, you need to go through all these rituals, you need to be a, a, a Jew and a Christian. Now, often, uh, when we've been reading through the Acts of the Apostles, we've noticed that a lot of troubles come from outside of the church. Uh, persecutions uh, from uh, people who don't believe in Jesus. We've seen that a little bit in that first missionary journey. And poor old Paul, of course, was stoned and left for dead on one occasion, wasn't he? Because of the preaching of the gospel. And so far, most of the troubles of the church have come from outside. But it isn't always like that. Because what we also discovered that some of the troubles in the church are from within the church. And we've seen that also as we've gone through Acts of the Apostles. For example, in Acts chapter 5, we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. They were part of the Jerusalem church, weren't they? But they tried to deceive the church, and they tried to lie. They lied against the Holy Spirit. They lied against God, didn't they? And they received the, the just punishment, the judgment of God upon them. And if you read in the New Testament, you read the, certainly two books where we're given a warning about people coming into the church who are wolves in sheep's clothing. And I'm thinking about the book of Jude and 2 Peter, which gives these warnings of problems within the church. And now in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, uh, these men, uh, these Jews, who were saying that they were believers, uh, reportedly from Judea, uh, they've come and they preach that you can't, really have uh, salvation, eternal life. By only believing in Jesus, you have to become Jewish as well. Acts 15 and verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. They've come without the authority of the apostles in Jerusalem, uh, they've come uh, without any calling from God, and they are preaching a false gospel. So that brings me on to my second point, and the second question, really. What is this false doctrine? What is so wrong with what these, these men from Judea uh, are saying? Well, let's, uh, let's throw up uh, verse 1 of Acts 15 again and uh, read what they were saying. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. You can't have eternal life. You can't have heaven, they said, unless you uh, become a Jew. And simply put, uh, they're saying in, these, in their words that Jesus is not sufficient for eternal life. They're saying you need something more than Jesus if you are to have heaven. And so they're preaching a kind of gospel, which is Jesus plus. Jesus plus works. Jesus plus going through the rituals and the circumcision and the, uh, the, the baptism. You can read about how you become a Jew in the, in the Old Testament. But the baptisms that are involved in becoming Jewish, they are... Uh, to be kind to them, perhaps, they are the precursors of what Paul was to describe as Judaizers. Uh, the Judaizers of the letter that he writes uh, to the Galatian church, because these people, or some of them like these people, had gone to 
the churches in Galatia and had been preaching exactly the same thing. If you really want heaven, if you really want eternal life, it's great that you believe in Jesus, but you've got to be Jewish. You've got to become a Jew. And uh, let's go to um, Galatians chapter 1, um, verses 6 to 10. We could have read a bit more of this chapter, but there we see the kind of language that Paul uses because it's obvious that these people have come to the churches at Galatia and have caused all kinds of problems and were speaking against Paul and the gospel. And he says to them in verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But then he goes on and says this, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. And that's a very strong word in the Greek. And he is being very strong in his condemnation of anybody who preaches anything different than the true gospel. And he, just to make sure that they understand what he's saying, he says it again, at verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Let him be anathema, that's the Greek word. Now, for I do... For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ, he says. Well, that is very strong language. Uh, Paul is very heated up about this. And it starts there in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, possibly when he first meets this kind of preaching. And this is a gospel issue, because the gospel is by faith alone, through grace alone, and in Christ alone. It doesn't, it isn't faith in Christ and works. It isn't faith in Christ and being Jewish. It isn't faith in Christ and being British. It isn't faith in Christ and going to church. It is in, it is faith in Christ alone. That is the way of salvation. It's not of works. The sad thing is that quite a lot of churches are preaching a gospel of faith and works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, is another letter of Paul to the church at Ephesus. He puts it very clearly in uh, this way. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, don't save yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Any other path other than the gospel, and the gospel is that you are saved through faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, saved by what Jesus did, dying on the cross, any other path that says anything different or adds to that is a path that leads away from God. And it's a path that leads to hell rather than to heaven. So let's ask another question in our third point. What was the appeal of this false teaching? What's the appeal of this false teaching? Why, why did he cause such a disturbance in Antioch, which had known um, some great teachers? They knew Paul and Barnabas as elders. They, they knew the gospel. So why, why did he cause a problem? Why was he causing a problem to the churches in Galatia that Paul has to write so, so uh, strongly against? Well, the answer is this. It appeals to men and women's sinful nature. It appeals to the sinful human nature that we have, doesn't it? The sinful human nature says, surely 
There is something that we can do. There is something that we can give. There is something that we can uh, do in order to earn our salvation. When I was a, a young Christian, as many years ago, I remember somebody preaching, and he literally said this, that if you want to go to heaven, you have to have 90% faith in Jesus, and then you've got 10% works. Well, he wasn't a gospel man, was he? Because it's 100% faith in Jesus, isn't it? It is in Christ alone. And the sinful nature is saying, look, I, I, I'm going to earn my salvation somehow. I've got to be able to go to the gates of heaven and say, look, you know, look at me, Lord. You know, I'm worth coming in. That's not the gospel. The gospel says, you're not worth coming in at all. You're a sinner. You shouldn't be here in heaven because of your sins. And the gospel says, well, your sins are paid for, dealt with by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the gates of heaven are open because you're clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. You haven't come in your own clothes. Remember that parable that Jesus talked about the wedding feast when the man is there in his own clothes and he gets thrown out. You've got to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ to go to heaven. It's all of Jesus. This kind of false teaching, this false gospel, uh, turns aside the gospel. It turns aside from looking to Christ as the author and the salvation and the uh, sorry, author and finisher of our salvation. And it, it, it turns it to yourself and says, look, this is what you can do to get there. This is what you can do to go to heaven. And in the case of these, these uh, Jewish people that are coming up to the church at Antioch, uh, they're saying, well, you've got to be a Jew. If you want to make sure that you're going to heaven, it's all right to have Jesus, but you have to be a Jew. But the gospel is about Jesus and what he has done. We've sung Rock of Ages, so I'm going to quote Rock of Ages to you. And you know by now that verse 3 is my favorite verse in that hymn, Rock of Ages, and I'm going to quote it to you. It's from Augustus Top Lady, and it, it speaks so eloquently about what the gospel is about. And there in that third verse we read, Nothing in my hands I bring. We haven't got anything. We can't, we can't persuade God to let us in. We can't go up to the gates of heaven and say, you, we are. here's the list of all my good works and all the good things I've done and what a wonderful person I am. And here's the test of me from all these people. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. It's only to Jesus. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the gospel, isn't it? And there's nothing else. Not, no plus, nothing to add to that. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to, the, to thy cross I cling. So the gospel is about God's grace and Christ's sacrifice. And this, and this only brings eternal life. So let's ask another question. Why, why is it important? Why is it important that, it, that you don't add things to the gospel? That it isn't Jesus plus anything else? Well, that brings me to the fourth point. Because it is dangerous. And we need to ask that question. Why is this doctrine, why is this teaching dangerous. And perhaps we can put it like this. Why does, why does Paul get so worked up in, the, in his letter to the Galatians and, and talk about the people being cursed by God? Well, the answer is this. There's two answers I want to give to you in this point. And one of the answers is this. Because this doctrine, this doctrine of the Jews that came up to Antioch, this doctrine of Jesus plus anything else has the smell of hell about it. This is the devil's gospel, not the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
there. This is none other, this is none other than a signpost that is pointing to the broad way rather than the narrow way that leads to heaven. The broad way leads to hell. That's the road that the devil wants people to walk along. Let me remind you of what Jesus said. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to get two readings from the Sermon on the Mount. But it's in the Sermon on the Mount. Listen to what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate. What's the narrow gate? It's the gospel. It's the cross. It's believing on Jesus as uh, the Lamb of God who paid the sin uh, of the world, our sins. Narrow, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And I want to say this. This is something that is a sadness in my heart. But I want to say this. I need to say this. That there are many people who claim to be uh, followers of Jesus. Many people perhaps who would put the title of Christian upon themselves who are walking that broad way and have not entered into the narrow way, through the gate of the narrow way. And as they walk through uh, on that broad way, they're uh, walking away from God and they're walking away from heaven and they're walking to hell. Let's hear some more words from Jesus. It's Matthew chapter 7 this time and verse 21 and 23. And Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we ha have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's very sober words indeed, aren't they? You see, the teaching of the Judaizers uh, were teaching faith and works. They were teaching, believing in Jesus is fine, it's great, but you need to do something else. You need to become a Jew. And this is nothing more well, than John Bunyan's Bypath Meadow, you know, Pilgrim's Progress. He has a Christian walking on Bypath Meadow. And one of the reasons why he was walking on Bypath Meadow was that the path was nice and smooth and it was easy to walk and it seemed to be going parallel to the proper road. And he thought, and his companion thought with him, that it was going to lead to the same place. It looked good, but it was leading to eternal destruction. And what we need to do at uh, times is to examine our own hearts and say to ourselves, am I walking that narrow way? Or am I walking that broad way? And the answer to that question, am I walking that narrow way, is to, is to say this. All of my, my hopes, my uh, assurance of eternal life is in Christ alone. Not anything else. Not anyone else other than Christ alone. Now, that's one answer why that's dangerous. So that was a long answer. This is a bit of a shorter answer. And the second answer that I'm going to give you is, here, is because uh, these preachers who preach uh, a gospel of faith plus something else, these, uh, these uh, Judaizers coming down from Judea and preaching in Antioch might have seemed to be very nice people. They may have come up with all their... Uh, degrees and their qualifications, and they can quote great chunks of Old Testament scripture. Uh, they may have seemed to be really nice kind of people. And the teaching that they had might seem to be so reasonable. It seemed to make sense. 
It seems to be full of love. It's not uh, condemning in any way. It doesn't focus on sin or on godliness. You can uh, live your life any way you like and you'll still be able to go to heaven. Not talking about holiness or godliness or being like Christ. And let me remind you uh, this evening that the devil, and Jesus said this of him, the devil himself can appear as an angel of light. The devil can look as if he is that gospel preacher. But really he's preaching a false gospel. And these men who came up uh, to Antioch and were preaching this Jesus plus doctrine were not working, were not serving the Lord, but the devil. Well, my final point, my fifth point, is to ask another question. What is to be done when false teachers appear in the church? Now, we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail next time, but uh, if we go to Acts chapter 15 and verse 2, uh, we, we see what happens. Now, Paul and Barnabas, when these false teachers came to the church at Antioch, they stood up and they argued, there was controversy, there were dissensions, disputes, and then uh, we read in verse 2, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they didn't let them get away with it. They were standing up in the meeting <laughs> and saying it's false. They determined that Paul, that's the church, determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about the question. There was going to be a, a church council, if you, if you can think of it in those terms, where the churches would gather together and say, now what is the gospel? It's an important question, isn't it? As a court, and the question that every church should, should be able to answer, what is the gospel? Well, what are we to do? Well, we'd be, we're to be like Paul and Barnabas. We're to stand up and say, that's not right. We're to stand up and, and fight for the gospel. We must call out the false teachers. And when we do that, if we do that, then we can expect trouble, can't we? Because this tolerant world in which we live will suddenly become intolerant of those who are seeking to preach the truth and declare the truth and to call out others who are not preaching the truth. But if we don't do that, what happens? Well, the church gets compromised. The church gets weakened. In fact, if you give it enough time, then the gospel is not preached at all for fear of what people might say and how we might offend people. We're not to offend people, but the gospel is an offense to the ungodly person. The Judaizers of Antioch caused trouble. They did they disturbed the peace of the church, so much so that Paul and Barnabas and some others are, are sent to Jerusalem. Uh, there's going to be, as we're going to see in the remaining part of this chapter, a council of the church is called to decide the matter. What is the gospel? What are you going to do if you're a Gentile and you come to faith in Jesus? Are you to, be, are you to go for these rites of becoming a Jew? But the point is, they must, it, it, it has to be made public. And we see that in verse 3 to 5. So being sent on their way by the church at Paul and Barnabas, they passed through Phoenicia, that's the old, uh, old Testament land of the Philistines, and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. We'll deal with that. Next time. And then verse 4. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. It seems wonderful. It's very positive. There's, there's, there are those who are rejoicing in it. Ah, yes, but, verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees, those who had said they were believing in the Lord Jesus, but uh, perhaps they, they really are Christians, we don't know, but they had a lot of baggage, a lot of Old Testament baggage that they had to deal with. But some of the sect of the Pharisees 
who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them uh, to keep the law of Moses. There were those who were still saying, yes, to have faith in Christ is great, but you see, it's easy and it's safe to keep quiet. To be in our little corner, to lift up the drawbridge and say, you know, we, we, we're going to keep ourselves to ourselves. We're not going to interfere or say anything to anybody. We, we know what we believe and we leave it there. But that is exactly what Satan wants. He wants to silence the church. You see, the, the devil can't destroy the church. The devil can't take away your eternal life. What he wants to do is to stop you speaking about Jesus. What he wants to do is to stop the church preaching the gospel. What he wants to do is to divert the church into secondary matters and make those secondary things primary. The last thing the devil wants, and this is to quote a, a Puritan phrase, the last thing that the devil wants is to have a church militant. A church that is on the offensive. The church that is going to shake the kingdom of the devil. The devil doesn't want that. What he wants is a, is a church that's ineffective. That's, that's soft. That's not, not going to harm anybody. That, uh, that you can forget about and nobody cares about. Isn't that a bit like the 21st century church? I'm, I'm talking in generalization here. Isn't that a bit like the 21st century in church in the West? That nobody's even really bothered about the church anymore. The church hasn't got a voice anymore. Uh, people don't care about the church. That's exactly what the devil wants. But the church isn't to be like that. The church should be intent upon going out and pulling down the strongholds of Satan. This is the very thing that the church is supposed to do. When Jesus, uh, before he is ascended into heaven, what does he tell the disciples to do? He tells them to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. That's what we've got to do. And that's the very thing the devil doesn't want us to do. And yet, the only way that we can do that is by preaching the gospel, telling the good news, that eternal life, that salvation, is by Christ alone, not anything else. And when we, when we do that, when we do preach the gospel, what will we find? Well, we're going to find the same thing that Paul and Barnabas found. There will be those who will be rejoicing in the good news of the gospel. But there will be others who will be condemning and say, but no, there's another way. We need to be the church that goes out and preaches the gospel because we want to give God the glory and we want to pull down the strongholds of Satan. And the gospel is the, is the tool, the weapon that God has given us through the Holy Spirit to do that very thing. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we, in this passage, we're saddened, Lord, of thinking of this church in Antioch being disturbed by those coming with a false gospel. But we praise you and thank you for Paul and Barnabas and others like them who were standing against them, resisting them. Uh, we thank you, Lord, as we, as we continue to read through this chapter, we find that the church of Christ uh, makes a stand and declares that for, for salvation, for eternal life, it is only through Christ alone. And we praise you and thank you for that solid rock, that the foundation, we pray, of this church, our foundation, as we stand as believers, is solely upon the solid rock of Jesus and nothing else. And Lord, even if the whole world be against us, and even if the whole world will seek to crush us, help us to stand as your servants. Help us to stand as the soldiers of Christ, uh, 
this evening and in the days to come, and that we might declare that gospel. Lord, we don't, like you, want any to perish. And Lord, we see it as an important issue that, it, that the real uh, gospel is about Jesus only. And may that be part of all that we do and all that we say and all that we think that it is Jesus only and not of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.